there's a line from a uh, from an old American movie uh, in which Chris Christopherson, the musician, who's the musician and actor, says that he has a great future behind him. And I think something like that is true of environmental philosophy and environmental ethics. Environmental philosophy and environmental ethics grew up at a particular moment, uh, certainly in Anglophone philosophy, in which environmental issues were being neglected by mainstream philosophy. So environmental philosophy grew up as a kind of parallel movement, a kind of subfield, a kind of counter tendency within mainstream academic philosophy. But increasingly what's happened is that environmental issues cannot be ignored. And the mainstream philosophical tradition has become increasingly sensitive to environmental issues. That doesn't mean that it's become sensitive enough uh, or, that it's, or that the treatment of these, of these issues uh, by the mainstream philosophical currents uh, is adequate. But nevertheless, uh, I think if we look to the future, what's happening is that the kinds of environmental concerns that led people like me and Holmes Ralston and Derek Calicut uh, and others to think of ourselves as environmental philosophers, uh, that that tendency is increasingly becoming uh, incorporated in just the mainstream of the, of the profession. The other tendency uh, is that the concerns of environmental philosophy are increasingly being incorporated into environmental studies as a, itself as a field, uh, which is reasonably open, perhaps increasingly open, to philosophical concerns. So for example, I myself uh, founded the Department of Environmental Studies at New York University. And, um, and I think uh, it continues to have a very strong philosophical current in the department. And I think it will uh, even after I have uh, become one with the Earth again. So the Anthropocene is an interesting concept because, first of all, uh, if, if you talk to some people in the academic world, it's now the common currency. And if you talk to other people, they look at you as if you've invented some neologism that they have no idea what, you, what you're talking about. And I think part of the issue here is that there are really two different conceptions of the Anthropocene that are in currency, and it's very important to distinguish them. So one conception of the Anthropocene is really the geological conception, the narrow geological conception. And the question of whether we're in the Anthropocene is really a question about whether the geologists are able to identify a particular layer in the Earth's crust that marks the transition from one geological epoch to another. Now, that conception of the Anthropocene is obviously of interest to geologists, but I don't think it is really central to why the notion of the Anthropocene has gained currency among some philosophers and social scientists and even humanists. And I think this second alternative notion of the Anthropocene really marks that there is something very different about the way that we live now and the way that humanity collectively affects the planet. Um, since roughly the middle of the last century in this period that sometimes is called the Great Acceleration, it's become increasingly clear that humanity together has been remaking the planet. Whether we're talking about the elimination of species, whether we're talking about the impoundment of water, whether we're talking about the changes in the composition uh, of the atmosphere, never has the impact of humanity ever been so profound on the planet. Whether or not this is marked in an identifiable layer in the Earth's crust really doesn't change the basic fact that humanity is become an extremely powerful force on planetary systems. Now the irony of the Anthropocene in the second sense is that while humanity has never collectively been such a powerful force on the planet, as individuals we tend to feel powerless in terms of the impact of our action. Strangely, it seems that humanity is in control of the planet. But as individuals, none of us really feel decisive to change 
the present course that we're on in the human transformation of the planet. And so I think what is really the distinctive mark of the Anthropocene in this second and important sense is the simultaneous perception of the power of humanity as a collective agent and the lack of agency, the lack of ability to be decisive over outcomes that we as individuals feel. And I think this is felt in our political life. It's part of why uh, our political institutions have increasingly become delegitimized. I think we feel it in our moral life, why we have debates, for example, about what I can do as an individual uh, to live ethically and morally uh, in a world of climate change, uh, in a world of sweatshop labor, uh, in a world in which more and more people uh, are, are, are living desperate lives uh, in, various, in, in, in various ways. So the fundamental challenge of the Anthropocene, I think, then, is how to recover this sense of agency that has been pretty characteristic of at least the sort of educated Western middle class since the time of the Enlightenment. So in 2014, I, I published a book called Reason in a Dark Time. And part of the project of that book was to try to understand why this Enlightenment idea, which is a very, very good idea, uh, which essentially celebrates the power of human rationality and science to anticipate the consequences of our actions and the threats which humanity and what we care about face, uh, and then the ideas that we're, we're able to act on those through our political systems, through our moral systems, through our economic systems. The challenge is to try to understand why there has been a breakdown in that framework when we face problems like climate change. So if we go back and we look at the history of thinking about climate change, we recognize, for example, that there were articles, at least in American newspapers, going back in the 1970s, uh, in which people said, if we keep burning coal, we're going to affect the uh, temperature of the planet in ways that have just simply played out in slow motion for over the, over, over the last 40 years. So the science has been there. Even in some sense, the popular consciousness has been there among people who cared to be informed about this question. But nevertheless, we've sort of been locked in this embrace where we move to an ever warmer world despite the fact that we know what we're doing. Now, it's very common, I think, to sort of want to blame political elements and the fossil fuel industry and um, the denial industry uh, for confusing us and knocking us off course and otherwise addressing this problem. And of course, all that's true. There are those bad actors, and they've been doing their best to pursue their own narrow interests, even while the planet continues to warm. But that's not the whole story. The, the, the story involves a much larger failure of our systems of knowledge and our systems of, of, of action. So in a way, Reason in a Dark Time, you can view as a pessimistic book. Uh, I viewed it really as a realistic book, uh, as a kind of autopsy, an attempt to really try to understand what's gone wrong with the human attempt to address climate change. The next part of the project is to try to understand how we can recover this sense of agency and this sense of meaning uh, that will allow us to address the problems of the Anthropocene. And I don't think that we can begin to move collectively without some sense of individual agency and empowerment. Now, that doesn't mean that I think that the solution to global warming is that we all ride bicycles or we stop eating meat, although I think we should all ride bicycles and stop eating meat. We should do those things. But the main reason we should do those things is not because the solution to climate change consists in everyone doing those things. It's rather that the beginning of the recovery of a sense of agency is to see what we can do in our own lives that puts us on the side of a different future. Now, this brings us to the question of love. Um, love has been uh, uh, an, a, an extremely central value 
for for humanity, um, really almost as long as we can recover human thinking. And love, of course, are arguments about what it means and whether there are different conceptions of love and there are certainly different cultural expressions of what of what love love means. But I think the essence of love was clear, most clearly stated by the British philosopher and novelist Iris Murdoch, who said that love is the very difficult recognition of the reality of other things. Part of the challenge of the Anthropocene is that increasingly as nature becomes remade by humanity, we lose nature as the object of love and the source of a kind of education in what it is to love. So the most effective way often of dealing with a threat is to face it as directly as possible. And in the Anthropocene, as we are threatened with the possibility of losing nature as an independent object of love, the proper response is to love nature, is to hang on to that love, is to grasp that love, is to realize that love. And in doing so, this will help us to maintain the independence of nature, the integrity of nature. And so goes nature, so goes our relationships with other people, with our political ideals, and so on. So I don't want to say that love is all you need, as the Beatles once famously said, but it's a pretty good start on what we need. And it's a neglected resource in the contemporary world. And it has, I think, its own distinctive role to play in the Anthropocene.